Hello students, this is Professor Krauss coming to you with lecture number 11, which is going to be part two of our examination of who is Jesus. We are now firmly looking at uh, Jesus. Our main focus is his life and death and resurrection. If you remember from the previous lecture in part one, we talked about how what it means for Jesus to be the Son of God. You know, the, that as Christians we believe uh, one God, three persons, Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And uh, we even talked about how the, the essence of Christianity is Christ, what we believe about Jesus. Now, G, when we say Jesus Christ, Jesus is his first name, but Christ isn't his second name or surname. Christ is a title. It means the one, uh, it, it references Messiah or the anointed one, the one who came to save us. And so now we are going to continue looking at what separates Jesus from others and why uh, Christians put their faith in Jesus for salvation. First, we look at incarnation. This is not to be confused with the word reincarnation, but incarnation means uh, God becoming flesh or the Son of God taking on human flesh. Now, God is spirit. God does not have a physical body uh, in the heavens, uh, but in the incarnation, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, who is 100% God, also became 100% man when he took on flesh. It means God became man, became like us to save us, but did not give up or lose his divinity. John, in his gospel, put it like this, John 1.14. The Word, in this case the Word is referring to Jesus, the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father full of grace and truth. And so John uses this description and said that, that God became flesh and, and dwelt with us. Uh, why is the incarnation so important to Christians? Well, it's because God chose willingly to identify with us, to become like us, to save us. Now, there are other religions, of course, that speak about love, God's love, but Christianity is the only religion uh, that says God so loved sinners that he became like us to save us. Uh, when God wanted to save sinners, wanted to save humanity, he didn't stay in the heavens or send an angel to do it. He came himself down to where we are. And so the incarnation teaches us that God became like us in every way, only without sin. Which leads us to Jesus. Uh, who is Jesus? Well, Jesus is the one who lived a sinless life. The Bible makes it very, very clear from the beginning to the end. There is no one who is innocent. No one can say they've never done anything wrong. Romans 3 goes into that and says to both Jewish people and Gentiles who would be non-Jewish people, there is no one who is good, no one who is righteous. They've all turned away. And so the idea is because of sin, because of us uh, choosing to live lives uh, uh, different than the way God wants us to or lives that are displeasing to God, choosing to do what's wrong instead of right, we all are guilty before God who is holy. Like we understand here on earth, because of our sin, because of our mistakes, we deserve to be judged, punished for those things. But Jesus lived the perfect sinless life, the one that we should have lived. He lived it in our place because we couldn't. The writer of Hebrews, Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us in our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And the reason why this is important is because Jesus didn't live in a bubble. Jesus, God himself in the flesh, came to live in our world, live among us, and he was tempted but never sinned, always did the Father's will, always did what was right, so that when he came to the cross, he was the perfect sacrifice for us. 
Jesus is also the one who does miracles in the power of, of God. He was able to do these miracles not just behind closed doors or like in a magic, you know, in a magic type setting, but he performed these miracles in front of eyewitnesses. Uh, from the very beginning of his ministry until his death, he demonstrated his control, his power over demons, over sickness, over nature, even death. In in the book of John, uh, book of John, just looking at a couple examples here, John two, Jesus turns water into wine at a wedding to bless the people that are there and prevent them from being shamed. John 4 and 5, Jesus heals people with different uh, physical defects and physical problems. In John 6, Jesus takes a little meal and uh, after blessing it, he feeds 5,000 people or more with it. And then he walks on water. He stops storms. He raises Lazarus from the dead. Jesus, in the very end, even overcomes death. Uh, John 20 and Acts 2 remind us that Jesus' miracles weren't done in isolation, but in such a way that people saw something they've never done. They saw something that would have been impossible outside of the work of God, and they were brought to a decision. Both followers and non-believers saw it. They witnessed His power. Uh, Jesus performed miracles, though, it not only as a way to prove His divinity— Jesus performed miracles to actually begin pushing back evil, to make a statement about why he came. He did not just just come to be nice to people and teach and live and die. That, you know, live and die aspect is especially why he came to live for us, to die for us. But he came to, to show that he was going to begin pushing back evil, that he was the one in control now, that, that sin and death and Satan would not reign forever and ever and ever, uh, that through his death on the cross, he was overcoming those things that bring devastation into our own world. In Matthew chapter 8, we find a story listen to this when Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man and said, I am willing, be clean. And the reason why I read this is to not only emphasize the miracle that Jesus does. I mean, leprosy was a deadly disease. It was a skin disease where... Your skin would continue to be covered with leprosy and it would begin attacking your organs and you would eventually die from it. And it was also a, uh, a disease that was considered unclean. So if you were diagnosed or said to have leprosy, you'd have to move outside of your home, outside of the entire city and live out with the other unclean lepers. Then why does Jesus touch him? Other miracles that Jesus did, he spoke them. He stops the wind and the storms with his voice. Um, he says, be healed, and he heals people. But why would he touch the leper? And I think it goes to show not only his love, but that he's in control. He is pushing back this disease. He's, he's come for that reason also. Uh, to talk about Jesus is also to consider fulfilled prophecies. After sin came into the world, God made a promise to the world uh, that he would one day save us. So it became a matter of when is God going to save us, not if is God going to is God going to save us. It is estimated that in the Old Testament there are over 400 and uh, 400 over 450 prophecies that one day would be fulfilled by the Messiah, the chosen one, the Christ who would come into the world that would be sent into the world by God. Now what's special about these prophecies is they were not written the time of Jesus. Uh, it was not someone who was observing Jesus doing special things and then began coming up with prophecies. These are prophecies that were written down hundreds, even thousands of years before Jesus was ever born, before he was even named. It's not even like there's a man named Jesus who's going to do this, but these are prophecies concerning the, the, the special figure, the special chosen one that God would send to the world and what he would accomplish. 
So here are a couple of them. Over 700 years before Jesus was born, Isaiah prophesied about a virgin giving birth. You know, obviously not something that is normal. Zechariah 9 9 says that the Messiah would ride in lowly on a donkey. And this prophecy is fulfilled in John 12 when Jesus does what is known as a triumphant entry triumphal entry into Jerusalem to come. He's later arrested and then put sent on the cross, um, put to the cross. But he rode in not on like a war horse to show that he's a king, but he came in on a donkey. Isaiah 52 and 53 talk about a servant who would die for the sins of the world. He is described as a sacrificial lamb. And then Psalm 3420 even says that the Messiah, that there's one whose bones would not be broken, which is fulfilled later by Jesus on the cross. So over 400 prophecies highlighting where Jesus would be born, how he'd be born, what he would be like, what would happen in his life, death, resurrection. And if any of these prophecies were not fulfilled, if any of them were wrong, then the reason to trust the Bible or Jesus falls apart. Because for a prophecy to be wrong, you don't listen to prophecies anymore. So what are the chances, statisticians, people who you know work with statistics and come up with big numbers, what are the chances of one, per, one person born hundreds of thousands of years later fulfilling eight of these prophecies? And they say that it would be 10 to the 17th power which is a number which is just ridiculous. It's the same number um, as if you went to the state of Texas, think about how big the state of Texas is, and you stacked two, you stacked silver dollars two foot deep throughout the entire country of uh, millions and millions and millions of acres, and you're able to go in and, and draw the one single coin that you marked and you buried in all of this. That is the same chance of one per one person fulfilling eight of these prophecies hundreds, thousands of years later. What are the chances of one person fulfilling over 400 of these prophecies? And they say there's not even a number. It's incalculable. The idea is that for someone to make these prophecies for different people from different time periods to highlight different things that a Messiah would do, and then for one person to come and fulfill all of these prophecies in their life is just, again, it's incalculable. Um, Jesus, when we ask the question, who is Jesus? We also have to reference with this idea of a king. Uh, Jesus was a king, but not the type of king that we think of. You know, if you think about the point of a king, kings reign. They reign over people. They reign over a kingdom. They lead armies and they make big decisions and things like that. And, and kings come to power either through being born into the line of kings or through force. But Jesus does not come into power uh, through force or through some kind of earthly lineage in the way we think about it. In fact, Jesus is not like any other king that's ever lived. Um, in Psalm 2, God says that he will put his son on the throne and he will reign over all peoples and kings will come and bow down and, and those sorts of things. But during Jesus' life, Jesus didn't act like an ordinary king. He wasn't going from village to village saying, Hey, I'm a king. Give me a throne. In fact, if anything, Jesus avoids it. There's, there's stories in the gospel where Jesus would do a miracle and the people would try to come and make him a king and Jesus would say, No, you know, this is not why I've come. I've not come to be an earthly king. I've actually come to be a servant and to die for the sins of others. And so that makes us kind of pause, like what kind of king was Jesus? Um, when Jesus goes into Jerusalem at the very end, he people treat him like he's a king, and yet Jesus does not demand to sit on an earthly throne. Jesus came to die. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 through 11, it said, But Jesus made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself, even to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God highly exalted him to the highest place, and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father." Paul writes this 
down about Jesus, and he describes him as a king, and yet he also describes him as one who came humbly as a servant, and not just any servant, but he came to die for us. You know, what kind of king loves people so much, and even bad people, that he's willing to die for them, to die on a cross and do that? But then Jesus We learn when Jesus dies on the cross and then he comes back from the grave and he's victorious. It says God exalts him and gives him the name that's greater than any other name so that one day people are all going to come to bow before him. And they're going to bow before him as Savior and Lord. One of the striking aspects of Jesus' ministry is his way of calling others to follow him. He invites people to leave their past, leave their families, leave their jobs to come and follow Him. And He promises to to forgive them of their sins and to give them a new life. He even goes so far as to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so Jesus is making this claim that He alone is a Savior. He alone can, can save us so that we can have a restored relationship with God the Father. Um, And it's through his death and his resurrection that Jesus is declared to be Lord. That there is no one, there's no one greater. That he truly is God, but he's the God who came to save us. um, Victorious over all things. So that as King, as Son of God, as the Christ, as Savior and Lord, Jesus promises anyone who turns to him, he promises them forgiveness Like we find in Mark chapter 2, Jesus heals someone but also says your sins are forgiven. Jesus says, as we just read in John 14, 6, I am life, that you can have eternal life. You don't have to fear death or the grave because God promises to give you eternal life through Jesus. And even the promise of becoming a new person. C.S. Lewis says, Christ is the Son of God. And if we share in this kind of life, we also shall be sons or daughters of God. We shall love the Father as He does, and the Holy Ghost will arise in us. He came to this world and became a man in order to spread to other man the kind of life He has by what I call good infection. Every Christian is to become a little Christ. The whole purpose of becoming a Christian is simply nothing else. So what Lewis taps in to is what the Bible says about becoming new creations or new people. When you turn to Jesus, He doesn't just say, hey, get your act together. I'll forgive you, but you got to do your part. But... God uh, in Jesus actually forgives us of our past, forgives us of all of our sins. And this kind of new life spreads to us so that we are given the Holy Spirit so that we can live lives that we're supposed to. We should have been living but couldn't beforehand. We, we used to live in sin, but in Jesus we have a new life. And let me conclude with this idea, this, this thing we're going to touch on later on in lectures, but the historical Jesus. You know, even... Today, even the strongest atheist does not deny that Jesus was a real person who lived in the first century. There's just too much evidence outside of the Bible and in the Bible for someone to, to say, hey, there's, there's Jesus is fraud. There's, there's no Jesus whatsoever. Um, the good thing is there is enough historical writings and even in the Bible that if you don't believe in Christianity or doubt really some of the stuff about Jesus, you can do the research yourself. You can rely on the research of others to see, is Jesus really who he says he is? Was he really God himself? Was he able to do the miracles? Did he really love people? Did he die and come back from the grave? Christians base our understanding of Jesus on the Bible. We believe this is the true word of God. But we do not only believe in Jesus because of the Bible. We believe that there is other evidence that proves that Jesus really is who he says he is. As always, I hope this was helpful in understanding what Christians believe, learning more about Jesus today. I hope you're doing well, and if there's anything I can do to help you, students, please let me know. God bless.